Awesome. We are going live right now. Um, shout out to those that may be joining us via Facebook. Um, and for those of you who may be trickling in, in too soon, um, warm greetings to you. I'll just give it 30 seconds just for people to arrive. Um, if you're just tuning in, this is a, a workshop on um, how to make effective submissions into the inquiry into migrant exploitation. Um, so, yeah, let me hear We've got Sharon as well here um, on the Zoom, helping us with technical issues. And if you're joining via Zoom or by Facebook, um, you can leave a comment or a question on the Q&A section and um, Sharon will be picking it up. So I'll just open this up um, before I introduce Ibrahim um, with a whakatoki, um, which is Ehara takutoa i te toa takitahi, enari he toa takitini ke, which stands for my strength does not come from me alone, but from many. So kia koto katoa, um, my name is Ricardo Menendez March. I'm a Green Party List MP uh, based in Tamaki Makoto. I'm an immigrant, uh, first generation from Tijuana, Mexico. And um, one of the portfolios that I hold is immigration, amongst several others. And I've got the privilege of um, being joined by my Labour colleague, um, Ibrahim Omer, who I'll pass on to, to um, for him to introduce himself. Kia ora, Ibrahim. Uh, kia ora, Ricardo. Um, um, thank you for, um, um, well, thank you for coming on board for both of us to put this um, event together. Um, my name is Ibrahim Omar. I'm a list MP based in Wellington, um, originally from Eritrea. I came as a um, refugee um, in 2008, so I would have been in New Zealand now for the last um, 13 years. And uh, my background since I came to New Zealand is, is I started uh, doing all sorts of low-paid workers, uh, low-paid jobs, um, starting from cleaning, security, housekeeping, you name it. And then I uh, went to uni um, and then um, uh, became union organizer, um, uh, just working with um, a lot of um, low paid workers. And many of them were migrants and refugees as well, um, until I, I became a member of uh, parliament. And at the moment of parliament, uh, I am a member of education and workforce select committee, which uh, the select committee that in, uh, launched this inquiry um, at the end of 2021. Uh, so I look, uh, I look forward to hear from um, from everyone who who's attending. Um, I also want to welcome uh, everyone that's uh, joining us today. I know that it's it's Sunday, and also at the back of today's announcement, I know that a lot of people minds um, could be um, somewhere else. But thank you for taking time from um, your life and also from your family to join us today, Namihi. But Abraham, yeah, fully, fully acknowledging that, yeah, people's minds will be in many places today. But um, yeah, th thank you for coming. Um, hey, look, well, I just thought um, before we get on to sort of tips about the inquiry, let's talk a little bit about the inquiry itself. I mean, you're a permanent member of the Education and Workforce Committee. I sub in for issues related to immigration. Um, but Abraham, like, you know, do you just want to sort of explain to people um, a bit of how this inquiry came about and why you think it's really important? Um, yeah, thank you, Ricardo. Look, um, this is uh, the migrant exploitation uh, has been going on for years and years in our country. And it became to the point where it's actually a black spot on our um, uh, on our record as a country, as a nation. Um, New Zealand is a country that everything is all about fairness. It's all about equality. But at the same time, we've got this um, disease called uh, migrant exploitation going on for a long time. And, and um, migrants are an easy target. Um, and uh, because of who they are, because of their circumstance, uh, they easily get um, prey for, um, for exploitation. But it's actually um, uh, affects everyone. A lot of um, New Zealanders, I know that I have done cleaning, I have done security, I have done housekeeping. Uh, I have seen it firsthand how people get exploited. Um, I will give you just one example. I came as a refugee when I first came to New Zealand. You obviously don't know the employment law in this country. No one, uh, it's not easy for people to understand employment law, your rights easily. Um, 
once you get a job and you are just so grateful for that job and you just want to get held into it at any cost because if you lose that job and then and the alternative is that you would be wandering around looking for the similar job and not to mention that places like Wellington are quite small employers talk and you're probably going to be uh, locked out of any employment opportunity I once was sick and I've called it my work sick because I had really really bad flu this is the early early days uh, of my employment and one of the supervisors told me well there is no one to cover for you you need to get to us well you need to get here as soon as possible so I have stood up off a bed and I took a train from Lower Hutt um, Tyra all the way to Wellington and to me that's an exploitation so exploitation is not just sometimes a denial of wages there is it's all sorts of um uh, it takes all sorts of shapes so at the back of this the education workforce select committee had decided to launch an inquiry i know that there is a, a work that the government is doing already because uh migrant exploitation got to the point where we cannot be quiet anymore um this is not to say that every employer exploits migrants in this country We've got great, I think the vast majority of our employers are great. They treat people with dignity, with respect, uh, but we've got quite a few um, dodgy employers that, that who explain. I think you, we have seen a lot of um, stories in the media uh, and over and over. So at the back of this, the education workforce um, select committee had decided to launch this um, exploitation um, Right at the end of 2021, um, the terms um, terms of reference are it's on our website. Um, you can check it out, and um, um, we know that the government is doing a lot of work in this space. I know that the minister Wood is is some of this is the area where he actually takes a lot of interest, and he's doing a lot of work. and And uh, big, one of the, the one of the reasons why people get exploited and they're quiet about it because um, a lot of them, their employment is linked to their visa. And, and a lot of them don't want to, they don't want to be told, uh, if they lose the job, they don't want to be told by Immigration New Zealand to go back to their country because they would have paid a lot of money to come to New Zealand. They would have taken a lot of um, money as a debt to come to New Zealand. So there is so many um, reasons why people get um, uh, exploited. We wanted to get to the bottom of this and we wanted to stop this. We wanted to know the reason why people are being exploited further. We wanted to know why people are not reporting this because it is a crime. It's simple as that. So uh, I hope that this, this, this is enough. Uh, this is where the select committee is, 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 was coming from when we decided to launch um, this um, ex, uh, this inquiry. Um, I think it was this, uh, November 2021 for the first time. This was um, this inquiry was launched. If if I am missing anything, Ricardo, feel free to um, jump in. And yeah, no, I think that's that's pretty um, thorough. And 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 I think that the thing I think about a lot when it comes to inquiries and these spaces for people to contribute is, you know, the 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 question that tends to come up a lot, which is, you know. Um, people make petitions and submissions all the time. Like, how does this actually change things? And and I think, like you were saying, Ibrahim earlier, um, you know, we were having a bit of a chat before we started. Is the the power of um, personal stories? Um, and 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 when people contribute their stories to the committee, it informs policy decision making. And so this is why. Um, an inquiry is so important because we'll be hearing from the workers affected. So often, you know, we'll be hearing from um, organizations or perhaps even the officials which have wealth of knowledge but may not necessarily be the people impacted by the decisions. And so this is an awesome opportunity to hear from, from people who themselves have experienced exploitation. And I think, you know, Abraham and myself, you know, we, we both, um, as, as former refugees, uh, somebody who was on a temporary visa myself, like I think we've got our own first-hand experiences of what it's like to be part of communities that tend to be at the front lines of, of these conditions. Um, so yeah, this is this is part of it and, and hopefully we'll be able to guide our ministers to make some really good decisions in the coming months. Um, so I, I reckon let's, before we get started on um, 
the sort of hot tips, just a reminder that, um, that you can use the Q&A function on Zoom to put a comment or um, a question if there is one. I saw already somebody in the chat um, thinking to share their story. And so we'll try and um, make some space for that. Um, and so in terms of the going into the hot tips part of it, um, I, I'll, I'll reckon I start with some that have come up um, through and through. One of them is people often used to feel or, or people often feel very intimidated about the idea of submitting to members of parliaments because I feel like it's a thing that most people haven't done and it can feel really scary. Um, in my previous job, when I used to work in the um, community sector um, with Open Action Against Poverty, I mean, part of my job would be doing this kind of policy work. And I used to feel so intimidated um, doing things like submissions because I, I, I would often feel like I'm gonna com come across as dumb or not coherent enough. And because English is my second language, you know, I would be really nervous that I would say something that people wouldn't get. Um, and now that I'm an MP, you know, I don't know, Abraham, if you felt this, like on some issues that we deeply care about, you know, when, when we see people opposing the progressive change we're trying to make, and sometimes we see some submissions, but I just think, damn, I wish I had the confidence of some of these people who are blocking good change from happening and just come to the committee and just present. And, and that made me think that I should have had far more confidence back in the day to make submissions <laughs> because often, if our community doesn't make them, it's the people trying to stop change from happening that end up presenting to us. Um, and so that's kind of my starting point in this space. Um, I don't know, Abraham, what your experience was. Yeah, if I may jump in, um, Ricardo, you're absolutely right. I think we can all relate to that. Um, I think the first time I um, submitted to parliament was in, two, I think in 2014, I would just, um, I was in transition from being a worker, a cleaner, to being a student at the CUNY. And uh, it was all has to do with workers' rights. I can't exactly remember with the detail of the submission, but uh, what the National Party was um, in the government at the time that we remember, we all know how workers' rights were eroded in the national government. I think the submission was to process some of the uh, the, the, the drastic decisions they were making against the working people. So it can be intimidating. Um, and then now um, we are sitting on the other side of, of the table and, and I look back and, and I can look back and see myself when I was trying to submit in 2014, how scary I was, uh, how intimidating it can be. Uh, but in that situation, that's just entirely normal. It's a, it's a human, it's a normal human feeling. You just ask for help, ask tips for from the people that who know. And luckily at the time, I had someone next to me who knew all the process. He took me through everything. He made it so easy for me. He was one of my uh, union comrades. So um, uh, it's okay to feel that way. Just to ask for help, ask for tips. But it's important that we all have a say on the issue that all, that affects all of us, and and at the back of uh, you you mentioned stories, um, uh, Ricardo, and to me I've always found um, um, sharing, uh, listening to personal stories. No one can argue against personal stories, and we know that we have thousands and thousands of people who expo who experienced exploitation in this country, and those can be either migrants or former refugees, even. Um, um, New Zealanders, that that because uh, my, uh, exploitation is exploitation, it affects people, of course, in different degrees, but in fact, it affects all of us. So I cannot emphasize enough that the people, if they can, I know that it can be intimidating, uh, but um, I know also that your submission, you sharing your personal story is going to make a difference. You need to tell us what you wanted to see, what kind of changes that you wanted to see because this is not just the select committee putting this together for the sake of the process. No, the government is really keen to make this change. There is a work already underway by, by the minister and the department, but you're um, you telling us, you sharing your story and telling us the changes that you like to see is going to go a long way and it's gonna make such a difference and you're gonna make it so easy for the committee to, to go further and make recommendations for changes as well. Awesome. And I think 
If you've never submitted to Parliament, um, let's let's just start by briefly explaining sort of the first stage, which is the written submission. We can talk about the oral sort of um, presentation um, in a bit, but um, we've had the submission link posted in the chat, so feel free to open it as we discuss. But making a submission is pretty easy. Effectively, you go onto the Parliament website um, and the Parliament website itself has a whole portal that just guides you through what you would like to say about um, migrant exploitation. It gives you um, the terms of reference, which is sort of the scope or the topics that we're likely to be covering. And, and you're able to then just put it in text um, as well as potentially even with the opportunity of um, being creative in terms of what you wanna uh, present um, if you wanna send a video, for example. Um, and, and one of the things that people often ask is, you know, does this have to be really long? And the answer is actually, no, it doesn't need to be massively long. It can actually be a page or too long even. I mean, we, I recommend keeping it succinct um, because the truth is MPs will be getting, um, you know, many, many submissions, dozens, sometimes hundreds um, on this issue. And, and if you feel like you've got a really long personal story to share, um, my recommendation is that you, at the beginning, have a, a, a short paragraph or um, bullet points of what are the things that you want changed. Um, and then you can lead on with a personal story if you've got like, you know, if it's a really big timeline, just make sure that you lead on with the key changes you wanna make so that when we're reading your personal story, we're kind of grounding it in the, the changes you wanna, you wanna make. Um, and so that's something I found really useful. Um, the second thing that I um, really advise is that um, you want to make sure that um, as you go through the personal story, you kind of think, oh, is this stuff that I'm saying likely to compromise potentially my current employment? Or is, am I saying something sensitive that may compromise my immigration status? Because if there is, the great thing about um, the, this, the inquiry is that you can let us know if there's something sensitive or private. Um, and in that online portal, you will be giving um, contact details to contact what we call the Office of the Clerk, which is the people who help us um, run uh, processes in the committee. And you can ask them to potentially make your submission um, private slash um, secret, which just means that we would be, for example, potentially hearing you um, and everything that you say stays just within the committee, it doesn't become a public submission. And, and, and I know that for many of you, that may be the case where you're gonna be talking about situations in current or potentially former um, employment. And so we just wanna make sure that it's a safe space. So just use that function, let the clerk know if you've got something that is um, really delicate so that you can be as open as you need to be because we want to hear sort of um, your truth um, which, which in itself will help us guide decisions. I wanted to ask you, Rahim, you know, when you were saying you got some tips from your union comrades, you know, do you remember any of those tips they gave you that you found useful at the time as a first time submitter? Yeah, I think I think the first thing is that the, this this is actually easy. Um, I I had a, a about one page of a written submission. And then I have asked it to, to share my story and the story of my friend. So the first thing he told me when I was preparing to submit was, he told me, what do you want to do? What do you want um, um, out of this? And so then I said, well, I want to, um, my voice to be here. So he said, okay, we're going to do um, just one page of written submission. And then you're going to ask the clerk's office that you are going to go and, and, and the submit for, um, um, in person. And he said that that's, that takes about, about five minutes if you are just individual or if you are, um, uh, submitting on behalf of the organization, taking 10, because I was part of the ET union, I was given 10 minutes and, and 10 minutes was more than enough for me to tell, um, to explain the issue to the committee. And also at the begin at the, at, at the end of the, the submission. And also I too was, it was, it was enough to tell the community what I wanted to see, because that's really important. Sometimes you can tell your story and go, but there are things that you know better than anyone, better than the community, but better than anyone, what changes you wanted to take place. So you need to do, you have to make sure that you're telling the community that 
that in detail that the changes that you wanted to see. So that's exactly what I did. So all those tips, I didn't know anything about this. So this guy was really, really helpful. And he took me through um, through everything. The most important thing that you can also always take the support person with you, someone that who can sit next to you and someone who can encourage you feeling nervous sometimes. And it's okay. A place like a parliament is quite intimidating place. As an MP, more than 12 months in the job, I see it get very nervous. And it's it can be quite scary as well. So it's normal or it's natural if you're feeling very, um, if you're going to feel nervous. So take someone if that's going to help. Otherwise, you can also ask us to send me through Zoom. That's mm. that easy as well because you've got an option. You don't have to be there in person. You can just ask the clerk office that you're going to send me through Zoom. And then they're going to send you all the login details and stuff. And so basically, um, to me, my tip is that, that um, just you know, find out um, what you wanted to say, what your main message is, and then at the end, just end it with recommendation. Share your story, how this affected you. So um, we know this is a crime. We know this should not be happening to anyone. I wouldn't wish it to my worst enemy. So uh, the good news is that the community is open to hear everything and that the government is, is, is keen to do the job to make um, any necessary changes in this because we are New Zealand and we can do better than this. Mm, sure. And, and Ibrahim, you were talking about presenting sort of orally to the committee. And so for those of you who may be new to the process, if you make a written submission, um, one of the, if you want to be heard, um, it's really important. And I recommend actually putting it at the beginning rather than sandwich somewhere <laughs> in the middle or end. Um, on top of saying the changes you would like to see, um, say, let us know if you want to be heard, because um, that's really important for um, the committee to know, you know, do you want to present orally to the committee? And I think, Ibrahim, I'm going to just repeat a few, a couple of points you've made. One of them is, yeah, you do have the potential to be heard. Normally, individuals tend to be given about five to ten minutes, depending on if you're um, a member of a broader organization. And um, the thing that Ibrahim said is that really that's really important, and particularly during times of COVID, is you don't have to be physically at the committee room in order to present to us orally. You can do it via Zoom. In fact, you can even do it over the phone if that's not your preferred option. Um, and and you know whether it's Zoom or in the committee, you can have someone there with you. Um, I think if you do decide to do an oral presentation. Um, my advice is that um, if you get five or ten minutes, you know, if don't repeat what you've already written, unless there's a point you really want to emphasize, focus on the changes you would like to see. And if anything, leave some time to have questions and answers with the MPs, because it's that um, you will have the opportunity to have a conversation effectively with the members of the committee. And that can be really valuable because it allows people to perhaps unpack things that maybe they didn't know. I mean, Abraham and I are deeply rooted in um, migrant refugee community. So, you know, the two of us are embedded in these issues, but um, some of the other members may be slightly newer to the issue and, and actually want to make sure all the MPs are fully across um, the issue of migrant exploitation. So the opportunity for us to ask questions and for you to answer que uh, those questions or make any additional comments is really important. I just thought, Abraham, let's just take a quick pause to sort of pick up on some of the questions that have come through because we've gotten some on Facebook and some through the Zoom. Um, so I'll start with um, one that's addressed to you actually from Jaspreet Kandari. Um, he uh, asks, uh, two reasons of exploitation are mentioned. One of them is um, migrant workers not aware of their rights. Two, they are scared to report due to employer assisted visa. And then follows with the question, are there any other reasons in your opinion, based on your experience as to reasons for exploitation? Yeah, well, it's at the end of the day, it's all about maximum profits, right? It's just a great um, employers at any cost. Sometimes they know some of these employers are taking risk. They know that they are um, uh, they breaking the law uh, by doing this. In New Zealand, it's, it's illegal to exploit anyone. It's illegal to pay someone less than a minimum wage, which is um, the wage that's set by the by, by government. We're not even talking about the living wage because the living wage is voluntary. 
we're talking about the, um, the, the, the minimum wage and, and paying anyone a penny less than minimum wage is illegal. We know that. But it's because oh, it's all about the profit. Um, and and this these people often they just they just don't care. They go ahead and, and they exploit people. And but they also know that people are vulnerable and the people don't know. Um, they they don't know. Look, uh, to me, um, um, always um, the best way to protect yourself and to, to have a voice is, is, is joining the union. And, and, the, and often the people that who get exploited are um, in, in the sector where it's very less unionized. And, and the people don't join the union and the employers love that because so they can take advantage of you. In my case, I was, I was bullied, I was exploited in my first job. In the second job, when I was working at Vic Uni, the union was, there was highly unionized place. I joined the union. I knew my rights. Every now and then, my union organizer would come in and expl explain things to me. So, so sometimes your workplace doesn't have to be unionized. You can go to any union, depending where you work, and ask it to be part of the union. And you can keep your membership even secret if you want. I, the, the unions can allow that to happen. And then and then you can get advices and you can get, and then if you end up getting in trouble and then the union organizer come up, God, that's the work that I use it to do. And I always use it to um, encourage people. That if you are op if you are scared of to openly join the union and then you can be a secret member and the union will provide you all the support that you need. So employers know that. And that's why they go ahead and exploit, exploit, ex ex exploit people. So it's all driven by greed. It's all driven by a maximum profit. Um, nothing more, nothing less. And I think, uh, and sometimes when you are blinded by something at any cost, you just wanted to get that thing. And, and that sometimes you don't even pay attention to how much that's going to cost you. Um, so so th those are the things. And uh, to me, I like to think that uh, and sometimes, and, and also because we're not collectively taking action, joining, the, for example, joining the union, um, um, and we are allowing for these employers to exploit us as well. So there are, we have got a lot of options, but for now though, we have this inquiry. This is an amazing mahi that's underway. And we've got the government that's actually getting us out of way to resolve this issue once and for all. And the next, we've got another one in today. I don't know how much time we have, but in 27, me and Ricardo, we're also gonna be in another webinar with you guys. If you come along, I can come with more details about the about the the sort of work that's underway uh, by by government. So um, uh, if if you are around, if you have spare time, please uh, tune in on on I twenty seven of January in few days, basically. So I have I hope I answered the question. Yeah, and I think just for the context of um, you know the, the reasons you were talking, Ibrahim, you know you mentioned. One of the most effective tools to fight exploitation is union membership and i think you know i i encourage people to write about maybe how even if they had become union members like what were their initial barriers for them to connect with um the unit because often it can be the language barrier or often it can be you know a lack of connection to um community services or unions and organizations i mean even um the fact that you know there's that whole conversation going on about whether um, we should have sort of um, union membership as a, as a default in some industries, and there's all that kind of kind of stuff. So, I mean, I, I think you know, if grounding it in our personal experiences, you know, when I first came to New Zealand, I don't remember being approached by anyone like in my job or um, even in my community, sort of telling me about my rights and 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 one of the things that. Um, we'd be keen to also hear, you know, is if you have made a complaint on exploitation, how is that experience? Because, you know, we also hear stories about maybe the labor inspectorate needing better resources, right? And, and that could be something if um, last workshop we held, we had some questions about or comments from people saying, oh, well, you know, I made a complaint and it took a while to resolve. And so um, that can be something that is also really useful to unpack if you did try to resolve it, because then the committee and government can then know like, well, what are the missing pieces in this puzzle and how can we best support you? Um, so it's also useful to hear from those who have gone through the whole process of um, making a complaint and um, understanding how successful that, that felt. 
Um, let's just go to uh, Sarah Ahmed has a few questions, a comment. Um, she talks about um, former refugee women are exploited, especially by cleaning companies, unions are non-existing and visible in the refugee space and the cost of membership is a massive barrier for them. Um, I guess, Ibrahim, do you have any comments around that or how people who feel that way could weave, if that's how somebody feels, how could they best weave it into um, a, a submission, for example? Yeah, so like like I said, Ricardo, I, I know, um, in, in regard to the Zahra's question, and I know that when I was an organizer, as a cleaner also organizer, I worked with a lot of former refugee women. They are the easiest target out of, out of, out of may, maybe, the workforce that works in, in this specific place. Um, for example, when we were at Vicuni, we had a, we were about 100 cleaners um, throughout all the shifters. And maybe half of this were between migrant and and um, and former refugee woman. And they are the easy target. They can't open their mouths because to them, the cleaning job is like a grace that does fall down from the sky. And at any cost, they want to keep it. They want to, they would have suffered to get that job. So. When you go through that experience, all you want to do at any cost, you just want to um, um, keep the job. And um, so it's, it's a language barrier. It's, it's a, and, and the lack of, lack of knowledge. Employment law is, is, is a very, very complex. We are talking about the basic, even the basic rules, basic rights. So the, uh, Zara, I know you live in Christchurch. And if, if, if you know uh, specific stories of women being exploited and there is no union existence, why don't you just get in touch with me? I can get you in touch with some of the big unions who are working in Christchurch who are organizing actually this area because cleaning is, is one of the areas where a lot of um, some of the big unions have interest on and they actively organize. In terms of submission, um, Zara, you can again, um, if, if you need any help, if anyone you know need help, please get in touch uh, with me, with my office, even with the Caro, and and we're gonna guide you how to how to submit because um, it, it is again, it's very important that we hear lived experience from people um, like a former refugee woman and also migrants, um, uh, unless we talk about these things, unless unless we we doing what we're doing now this is gonna carry on and we cannot allow that to happen. One of the questions, thank you, Ibrahim. And one of the questions that came last time was sort of um, people saying, um, you know, I face exploitation by potentially my tertiary institution um, or, you know, even people who feel like um, they face exploitation because of the, you know, by even like, the partner, right? And and how and and sort of people's um, experience around that, you know, would you encourage people who have a history of exploitation with their tertiary institution to also sort of weave in that and how that works, like for them? And and because I mean that's something that I think that has come up. So like I don't know if you through your constituency work that's something you've seen on the ground. When you say, when you say tertiary institution, it's like universities and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You said there is no exception. Um, this inquiry is open to everyone, and and we want to do eradicate exploitation from this country, either in in a high in educational institutions, or or in a cleaning industry, or security, or in hospital, or even in a, in, a, in a dairy sector where uh, we know that a lot of people get exploited as well. So there is no exception at all. This inquiry is designed to hear from anyone. We wanted to hear from you if you if you ever got exploited anywhere, anytime, by any way, any minutes, get in touch. We would like to hear from you. Awesome. Another question that has come up from Manoj. Um, so it says, I lost my one of resident 2021 opportunity because there was no exploitation visa available at the time. So I changed to a student visa. Um, he then asks, can you please ask MP Ibrahim how he can help us? <laughs> and I think um, just before I go to you, um, Ibrahim, on this, just want to say, Manoj, I think this is um, a really important experience I would recommend you sharing in terms of um, how exploitation worked for you before the, the, this new visa that's available for people who were exploited happened. Um, I think, you know, 
um, the stuff around having to shift to another visa because of exploitation is something that is quite common. But I guess, um, Ibrahim, maybe you can talk a little bit about, um, if you want, about the, the new visa that was launched this year. And, and I guess just also, you know, to my knowledge, what would be, what do you think would be useful to highlight around somebody who went through that um, exploitation and changed visa? Yeah, Manoj, I, I to top of what Ricardo just said, uh, it's really important that you submit and you tell, you share that experience with our select committee. And uh, and regarding to the to, to the new visa scheme, um, and 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 we've now we've got a new rule where if you if people are exploiting, they 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 are allowed to to apply to um to, to MB, and and then after the investigation. And you're gonna, you're gonna, you'll be allowed to basically leave this employment, and then you've got about six months to look for a new employment for new employer as well. So hopefully this is a solution. We know that um, uh, this is the work in progress. It's actually we we know that um, I was reading about it the other day. It's already making a difference for for many people. It's the policy that's that's working. But in saying that, we're gonna need more. So that's why we need to hear from people so we know what we need to do. And that we also want people to tell us what are the things that, you see, these are the things that's going to help. Experience like this. Th thank you for sharing it here, Manoj. And I do encourage you to submit and to come and tell us your story because we're going to make a recommendation to the house and we're going to make a recommendation to the minister. We're going to tell the minister the, the things that we would like to see changing so um, and and I'm sorry that um, that um, the new that you couldn't take advantage of the new policy, and hopefully things will go well for you, and we will see what we can do. I can't promise anything, but we will see what how we can help you. Um, get in touch with me and Ricardo, but at the same time, I encourage you to um, to submit. Awesome. Um, that's the question we've got on Zoom at the moment. I'm just going through Facebook and just scrolling up to just check the questions we've received there. Um, so we've had a comment that talks about how while well, consultation is important, um, people at the grassroots are, and I'm gonna paraphrase this because it's quite long, are <laughs> tired of presenting submissions to parliamentary committees when they want action, um, they talk about that they believe there's an overemphasis in submission. So I guess sort of we've got someone who's feeling a bit um, disenfranchised by the process. Um, and I can totally see how some people could end up feeling that way, right? Because people do pour their, their heart and soul into um, presenting onto us. And if change doesn't happen fast enough, I know that can be really frustrating. I guess in this situation, and Abraham, it'd be great to get your perspective, you know, at least in the time I've been involved in political mahi, like I don't recall there being a such a broad inquiry into this. I know certainly that wasn't a priority for the last government, um, the, the national led government, um, the past, you know, over a period of nine years. And so I do feel like in this case, there is sort of a um, really historic opportunity to get some really good results. Um, so I don't know how you feel about this specific inquiry in terms of people who may be feeling a bit like, oh, I feel like I've seen submissions and things don't change, um, you know, what would be your message? Yeah, no, I, I like I like to um, to add my two my two cents into that. I, I it's uh, I know I know how this person or or many others feel about this because sometimes the system can be really um, frustrating. Let's be honest. Um, but it's because the system is frustrating we can't just um, sit down and do nothing we have to still um we have to keep trying to change to change things um look this uh, this is not just an inquiry it came out of out of nowhere out of the blue we have the minister that's actively working to change this and we have got the policy that's that i just i just one of the the policy that's that's um a government is working on. It's already in place, for example, the new visa scheme for exploited migrant workers, for example, which is making a difference already. So, and and um, I the, there is a work on the way. And there is, this is a work in progress. It's not just this committee is gonna hear uh, from people and then we're gonna make a recommendation, it's done. No, 
we're not gonna stop there. We're gonna go and work with the minister. We're gonna go work with, with departments, of course, through the minister. And the select committee is gonna make a recommendation to the house and also to the minister. And there is gonna be, um, um, I, can, I can promise you, this is not gonna be business as usual. There is gonna be a change because there is a government, we have a government that actually cares and there is a work in progress. So while I understand and I, I know how you feel about this, uh, please don't be put off. Get engaged and tell us the change that you like to see. Awesome, Shilda, Ibrahim. Got some couple more comments um, to pick up. So, um, you know, we got somebody who feels like, um, you know, we hear a lot in the media that often it's our own communities exploiting members of their own community. <laughs> um, and, and I guess, you know, that can be something you can highlight in the submission, but I recommend that if you do talk about that, you know, reflect on um, why that might, why you may feel that may be the case, you know, because my experience has been that, I mean, we, because we, our communities know how precarious our lives can often be, it can, it, it can also become um, a source of, you know, people knowing how to drive exploitation, right? I don't, I don't often think it's a, a cultural thing so much as it is a nature of, of actually understanding the, the people's livelihoods and having access to members of those communities. Um, but it is always really sad to see a member of the migrant community being the one perpetuating exploitation. Um, ultimately, you know, what, what I think I always recommend people focusing on their submission is what are the changes you want to make so that this doesn't happen anymore um, beyond sort of the um, identifying who you feel is a culprit is also saying, well, if you were in that situation being exploited by somebody from your own community, what do you think would have helped you at the time um, leave the situation, um, whether it would have been a visa like the one we've got now or a pathway to residency or just access to unions, like access to the labor inspectorates, like I recommend you reflecting on that kind of like put yourself back in time and think what would have help you leave that situation. I don't know, Abraham, if you've got some tips for people who may be feeling like it's members of their own community who are doing the exploitation themselves. Yeah, no, I've heard that a lot as well. And the one comment I would make about that is, I think whether the, the exploiters are whether they are from migrant community or non-migrant community, it's happening because the system allowed them to do that, right? And that's what we need to change. And that we need to um, make sure that uh, whether from employers from migrant backgrounds or 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 others, we have to make sure that they they this 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 practice are not perpetuating in in our country. Full stop. We need to stop that. But I've heard a lot of stories that that um, that a lot of employers from from migrant background or migrant community um, have been exploiting people, and I've seen some really really sad stories as well. So. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, again, I will go back to the point that I make earlier that it's because the system is allowing this employers, the greedy employers, to exploit people. And that's what we need to stop. Once we have a law that's going to punish people, and then it will stop. That's what we need to have in place. Awesome. We've got one last comment here from um, someone talking about, um, you know, complaint that they've heard in the news about people on the migrant exploitation visa being asked to leave the country, um, you know, after six months, um, basically kind of making the point that, you know, they didn't find the visa to be long enough to either find them, you know, help get all the work or leave exploitation or relocate. Um, this person is making that um, it would be good to extend this visa category for a longer duration um, so that investigation could be completed and I guess mm -hmm. just briefly you know if um, if you're feeling that way um, let the committee know if you feel like the migrant exploitation visa doesn't last for long enough and you feel like people need you needed more time or your community members needed more time to find different employment or heal from traumatic experiences um, that's incredibly valuable feedback I don't know what you think Ibrahim because that could be something yeah. people could yeah I, I did I did hear for quite a few um, comments about the, the six months um, uh, time frame not being not being long enough, um, especially in this the environment of, of COVID nineteen, um, where uh, 
moving from one employment to another often can be can be difficult. Um, um, like you said, Ricardo, and that's, if that's how you're feeling, come and tell us. We would like, to, you know, um, from you and not just me and Ricardo, but the whole committee needs to hear this. This inquiry is very important. You submitting is going to make a difference. Hmm. Awesome. I think that's in terms of the questions that we've had so far, that's all that I could pick up. So I guess, Ibrahim, just as we're sort of reaching the three o'clock mark, you know, are there any comments or other tips that you would like to share um, to people in terms of, you know, and especially I think, you know, as somebody in your case, you know, you've done a submission when um, before being an MP, but now you've gotten to hear submissions from heaps of people like, what do you what do you feel like when you have someone in front of you making a submission? Like, what are the things you're often looking for that catch your attention, or that um, you know, or that help you understand what their main point is? Yeah, I mean, I, I think when when you are if you for example if you are a politician that come from um, a, a background that's nothing to do that that like working in a in a low paid work sector or industry, it, it can be really difficult for um, politicians to, to easily connect or understand uh, where people are coming from. But in my case, um, only a few years ago, I used to do this job. And I, I, I was on the other side of the table and I submitted to the select committee. Actually, the way that I was treated was, was quite, it was really nice. Even um, you know, like MPs that who didn't agree with what I was saying in my submission, a safe respected me, and um, they thanked me for coming. And 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 so, um, I can tell you, um, our select committee is it's, it's people are very friendly, and you will be treated with respect and the love, and the, and mm -hmm. with encouragement. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is that all the members of the our select committee has agreed on the terms of reference of this, this inquiry. So it's not like you're gonna be goaded with questions and stuff. People are very sympathetic. So mm -hmm. um, come come and tell us, don't share away. Um, uh, to me and, and you, Ricardo, it's it's incredibly um, a privileged position to be in, to hear uh, from people. We are not just coming out of nowhere and, and trying to do this work. We come from background. We were, um, we live with this experience. We have been there and we have worked with people that who are, and I still every day, people, even after I became an MP, people, a lot of people got my phone number and, and when things go wrong for them and in, in their um, employment place, people contact me, asking for advice, telling me what to do. My first advice is always, if you are not in the union, join the union. Um, but then uh, I, I try to give as much advice as I can. Um, so, um, um, if you come and share your story, you're not going to be judging. And because we understand where you're coming from, we understand your pain. We will listen carefully and we will make recommendations. And we all want the same thing. We want change. So um, the last comment that I wanted to make is that on 27, we have another webinar, another session with, with Ricardo. I would like to see you more. We're going to make Facebook posts about it. Please share it with your uh, networks, with your families and friends. I would like to see you there. Yeah, and it's really important we get as many submissions as possible from people impacted by this. I mean, look, if you're watching in and you're actually a Kiwi who has worked with migrants and you've seen exploitation happen, like, I also want to hear from you. <laughs> but um, but ideally, we want to hear the, you know, from the people who've been um, through exploitation. Um, there is one last comment that came through just now that I will address and then we'll close um, because I think this is really relevant to the stuff you were saying at the beginning, Ibrahim, around employer bond visa. So this person talked about, you know, when you are an essential skill visa holder through employer, then the, then the employer knows that the employee are not able to work elsewhere. That means it's difficult to um, for the employee to get progress in their role and promotions at, um, you know, through through different stages. This is also exploitation. And I just want to say, you know, um, that's a really important point. Explo like exploitation and the power dynamic and the imbalances can be as um, sometimes not as like clear or visible as people may think. So if you, if you feel like you've been in situations where because of 
you're in an employer bound visa and that's created the conditions that the person here just described. I think that's really important to highlight. Like if you felt like you couldn't even discuss your pay with your employer because um, you know, your visa situation basically like made you feel like it would compromise your ability to stay in the country. Um, that's something we want to hear. I mean, obviously, like Abraham said, join, join your union. They will help you out and when you're feeling like that. But, but obviously, that may not always be the case for every worker that um, they, they may know how to navigate, you know, um, reaching out to a union, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, we, that kind of story is really important. To add one comment on that, I think I mentioned this earlier. Um, exploitation have so many, like it can happen in many, many ways. If, if, if your employer is, is, is not allowing you to take your short break, for example, uh, if your employer, if you have to ask for your, your permission to go to the toilet, to sleep, and, and if you are overworking, all these are exploitations. If you are going through these experiences, come and tell us, talk about it, don't be quiet. Yeah, awesome. Hey, well, Abraham, yeah, thank you heaps for, for being in the, getting the privilege to share the space with you. Um, and to all of you who have joined, yeah, thank you so much for your comments and questions. Please do share the next event, come along, invite your friends. Um, if you feel like you've maybe started writing your submission and you get stuck, you know, come to the next workshop and ask us questions about what you've written so far. Um, and hopefully we'll have a really successful inquiry process and we'll get some really progressive changes along the line. Um, I'll just close this up um, with a whakatoki as well, um, which, which is um, kia natahi aite to e pakari aite tuara, which stands for stand united, stand strong. Um, so kia ora everybody. Thank you for those of you who put those marvelous questions through and to those who are new on Facebook for joining in and we will see you on the 27th. Kia ora. Kia ora.